Hi, and welcome to 10 Minutes with Professor Abrantes, brought to you by the Ethology Institute. Today, we bring you part two of a very interesting conversation that was had between Michael McManus and Professor Abrantes. Michael McManus, a tutor here at the Institute, had some follow-up questions about some previous 10 Minutes episodes. This one in particular, we're going to focus on resource guarding and just all kinds of all kinds of really good stuff. So without any further ado, we bring you part two of the conversation between Professor Abrantes and Michael McManus here on 10 Minutes with Professor Abrantes. Um, resource guarding is still a term that I use, and I, I want to talk about that. But um, when we talked about resource guarding before, it seemed like you had problems with the word resource, but you use the word resource in your dominance definition. So it's not really the idea of resources or having displaying certain behaviors to gain access to resources. That's not the problem. Uh, should basically dog trainers, would you prefer if dog trainers were calling, was called this dominant behavior rather than resource guarding? Is that your preference? Like that, because it seems like when a dog trainer yeah. talks about resource guarding, they're talking about dominant behavior in presence yeah. of certain resources. Yes, I would prefer, and you are also right that I, I have no nothing against the term resource, but I have something about the term guarding, uh, because that's not the, the experience that I have, and I, I, I can tell you that I talked with the colleagues about that, and I asked especially about resource guarding, what's the experience they have, and if they have seen it in any species, and particularly in canines, and not one of them uh, could confirm that. So we agree that uh, most of what is called resource guarding is just uh, bad manners, uh, you know, deficient uh, socialization of, of, uh, of the dog, of the puppy. Um, dogs, canines do, do, not resource, uh, do not guard resources like that. Even they have the resource or they don't. If they leave the resource, then the resource belongs to no one. It's not, oh, that was my bone. No, it, that was not your bone. It was your bone while you were chewing it. When you leave, it's not your bone anymore. It's uh, it's everybody's bone. Right, right. But well, yeah. But but there are typically there can be dominant displays over these resources. Correct, correct. Yeah. And so there are disputes. Can we call those disputes of ownership? Yeah, not of ownership, but of. Um, uh, right to use at that time you know there is a bone there and they if they both want the bone at the same time then they will growl and and that's where uh, ranking comes in, into uh, play uh, because in order to avoid the uh, serious fights the higher ranking will normally get the resource uh, that is if that is uh, if if it happens at the same time simultaneously but now again if a lower ranking has uh, the resource then the higher ranking has to consider the the the, the benefits of uh, fighting for the resource higher than the costs that it will imply, and um, it has to be a, a resource of a very high value for a higher ranking to to uh, use uh, aggressive behavior because then it's not dominant behavior any longer. Then it's aggressive behavior uh, to gain access to the resource and take it away from the the lower ranking. Okay. So you, know, you have to look at that again, uh, uh, and, and I know you like very much the, the concept of evolutionarily stable strategies and cost and benefits. And that's exactly the way that you have to analyze every single situation. What is the cost and what is the benefit? And then you, you very clearly, you, 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 you know what is the best strategy at, uh, for, for every single situation. Mm -hmm. So let me like now react to one of the things you said in your resource guarding video about your, your one of your objections to it is that you felt that it maybe like legitimized the behavior of the dogs and made it acceptable. Um, my personal experience with the term is the opposite. The reason I use resource guarding is if I, the term resource guarding is if I go to a shelter and someone tells me this dog resource guards, what they're telling me is a warning, be careful. And they're saying this dog cannot be placed in normal households, it can only be placed in households with with people who are prepared to deal with that behavior. Or same, if I'm talking to another trainer and they say, hey, this dog resource guards, they're warning me, they're telling me, be careful. This dog has a, t it could bite you or it could do something that you might trip up, up on that dog. So usually it's not accepting of it. Um, and it does seem to convey that information for me. Um, I have the opposite reaction. When, if we were to call it dominant behavior in my mind, 
I would say it, it, that seems more safe because it's normal. It's natural behavior for the dog, right? Resource guarding seems to indicate something above and beyond what would be normal for a dog. Well, it, it depends whether it is normal or not. I mean, to, to, to be uh, showing dominant behavior, what you call resource guarding in this case, over a, a, a trivial item uh, and to be prepared to fight for it, uh, that is not normal behavior. No, no sane uh, animal. Uh, and no same canine w w would do that. Maybe the only animal species that I know that does the, that kind of things is the human species. But <laughs> in others, it's uh, very clear cut. There is no losing face or anything there. There is not. It's not worth fighting. Let me go away and um, find something else to do. So um, I think that um, calling calling it resource guarding, making it such a pompous term. Um, it really makes it uh, legal <laughs> to uh, to 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 show that kind of behavior, and you see f f uh, on in social media uh, people defending very strongly that um, it's okay and uh, the dog should eat in another room even if the dog resource guards the food uh, and all that, and that is definitely not normal behavior for for uh, canines which are social animals which since they are puppies they they are used to uh, to eat together to sleep together to um, to to solve their resolve their issues by means of dominant and submissive behavior instead of aggressive behavior what you call resource guarding there uh, that behavior it's not dominant behavior that's aggressive behavior uh, and that's a serious thing and that is what i cannot accept because it's not normal yeah. canine behavior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that makes sense to me. Um, and I agree. Although, yeah, with my own dogs, like if my dog's eating out of a bowl of food on their own, and another dog approaches, and the other dog growls and says, "No, this is I'm eating this bowl of food," and the other dog leaves, and I consider this a totally normal, fine interaction. And they can also eat all together in the same room, and I can throw food on the ground. They can all eat together, and these are all normal things. And what a lot of people are worried about in their dogs, the behavior they see, I consider completely normal. On the flip side, like I'm usually not thinking about that. I don't care about that part of things, maybe because my dogs all get along. Uh, I'm talking about when a dog resource guards against a human or shows dominance displays against a human, that falls into a different category to me. Yeah, that, um, that is not normal behavior at all. Uh, a canine and the social animal should not be like that. That is a behavior that we have created. Either, either we have created it by, by uh, deficient breeding, which is a possibility. We have a, we breed animals like the wind blows, you know, um, don't make tests of the parents, behavioral tests, of course. Uh, so in the end, we may end up with a, with a dog containing lo loads of genes for, for displaying aggressive behavior instead of uh, the dominant submissive strategy. And the second is uh, a, a training. Uh, since the puppy gets home, uh, we, we teach and encourage the puppy to become a little uh, selfish uh, king and queen. Uh, and then later on, this is what, what it, it results in, you know, this uh, uh, abnormal aggressive behavior, uh, which um, you call um, resource guarding. Now, could the breeding, which you call deficient, which I'm sympathetic to that, the, the idea of breeding this is deficient, but on the flip side, could it serve a function? Could breeding dogs to display higher levels of aggressive behavior, yeah, could that serve a function? You have guard dogs, you have livestock guard dogs, you yeah. have these dogs who need to show higher levels yes. of aggressive for their role in their communities. Yes, that's correct. But then you have to pay, be prepared to pay the price. You cannot have it both yeah. ways. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you develop dogs to, to show more uh, aggressive behavior, and again, when we speak about genes, let me clarify one thing. Um, uh, I don't mean that there are specific genes, maybe there are, um, that determine, uh, th that have a label saying aggressive, and another one says fearful. Uh, but the, a tendency to, uh, to react uh, quicker, uh, lower th thresholds to show that behavior rather than another behavior. But yes, you, you you can do that, but then you pay the price. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Most most genetic things are not as simple as coat color. And even coat color, like 
uh, I've read some studies about how coat colored jeans also influence other things, behavioral yes. things. They're so, it's so complicated. It's not, there's not a gene for aggression that you could just replace that gene and the dog's not aggressive anymore. No, no, there, there is not one gene. If there is anything, there is yeah. a, like, like you said, with coat color, but m even much more complicated. Yeah. Um, there are loads of genes and the, 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 they also, uh, their effect can be released at uh, different times, depending on maturation and also depending on the environment. This is one of the exciting things that epigenetics uh, has taught us the, the last uh, decades. And that does it for part two of this really fascinating conversation between Michael McManus and Professor Abrantes. And you know what? There's more. We will bring you part three next time where they will continue. They will continue this conversation. There is more. It's really, really, really good stuff. Can't wait for you guys to see it. Now, if you can't wait until the next 10 minutes with Professor Abrantes is published on the website of ethology.com, EU, where we always put them up first. If you can't wait, there are plenty of other articles. There are articles for you to read. There are courses for you to take. Lots of good information there at ethology.eu. And if you go to the link for 10 Minutes with Professor Durbrantes, that is where you will find part three first. We will be back next time with another edition of 10 Minutes with Professor Durbrantes. <laughs> <laughs>